about it. Then I thought I'd quite like to write a book about Shakespeare and started investigating and investigating. Extremely interested about that and firing off into a, a very big and long conversation with the person who was quite knowledgeable about it. And it rested in the base of my skull uh, for a very long time after. And I had a, a little godson who I told about this and he asked so many questions that I couldn't answer and I thought I'd better get to know a bit more about it. In the end, after reading about 10 or 15 books on the subject, which all absolutely delighted me, mainly, mainly Baconian books, but I came to the view that the most likely person who was carrying the name of Shakespeare, and I, put, I say that rather than say who was Shakespeare, because I still think there were probably more than one hand in there, but the, the main person I felt was Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, but that uh, he lacked what I felt was an absolute essential component, which would be a contemporary at the time uh, linking his name to Shakespeare. And when I found that in a work called Polymantir of 1595, then I came out of my closet, as it were, um, uh, as an Oxfordian and, and have been digging around the contemporary allusions uh, ever since with, I'm very proud to say, with Roger Stripmatter, who, who I notice is on this, um, on this thing. So hello, Roger, I'm, I'm delighted you're on here. And, and he and I have been uh, working together tires, tirelessly for about six years, um, looking at every single, uh, what you could vaguely call contemporary allusion to Shakespeare and, and seeing what those people are really saying. Thank you, Alexander, for those comments. And thank you to the Shakespeare Authorship Roundtable for very kindly inviting me to talk today. I'm going to talk about John Dee, and I suspect many people know a lot about him already. He was a very learned mathematician, scientist, astronomer, philosopher, alchemist, astrologer, a teacher, a spy, and a communicator with demons and with angels. He was educated at St John's, Cambridge, and later became a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. He was very well known about the court, not altogether loved and trusted by everyone, though he had his supporters. Lord Burley, for instance, was very much on his side, using him as a spy, we think. And the Queen also held him in very high regard, used him to uh, divine good dates to do things on. She called him my noble intelligencer, most faithful D, and my ubiquitous eyes again suggesting that he was used as a spy both in England because important foreign dignitaries came to see him and find out about his learning and his maths and also abroad where he was at courts in Bohemia and Czechoslovakia etc and so he was certainly regarded as a spy he's a very strange man and he's becoming very very popular there's some pop singer I think called Ghost Domain who has had Absolutely, I haven't seen the number now, but millions, I mean millions and 80 million hits uh, with a pop song called John D. So he is becoming a subject of enormous interest, and mainly, of course, through his, his magic and his connection to angels. We have a great number of books that still survive of his taking down conversations with angels. He wrote quite a few books, not Many of them, though, were published. I suppose the most famous is this, called Monus Hieroglyphica, first published in 1564. Here's the uh, second edition of it in 1591. And it's all about what you see inside that cosmic egg on the title page, what he would have referred to as the literal signature of the beginning and root of all things, of the universal force of creation from whence all knowledge derives. He called it the Hermetic Seal of London. And this little book goes into every line. There was actually are only seven lines of it, but he analyzes all the lines, the angles, um, the points. And he tells us that this contains uh, everything about the creation of the universe. It has uh, the symbols uh, of the alchemical symbols, the symbols of all the planets. Uh, it helps to square the circle and show man's relation therefore uh, to the divine the connection of the material world to the divine and it also goes into the planets and the connection between the planets uh, the connection in geom geometrical connection between the moon and the earth uh, the sun and also touches upon the septagon the famous sigil of amet which used by d to conjure up angels and demons he slightly denied that he uh, 
conjured up demons, but we can go into that later. He uh, wrote two remarks which I think are of fundamental importance to understanding the Shakespeare authorship question and unlocking it. He was also, in my view, uh, a very important witness to the Shakespeare authorship question, and I'm going to show also uh, how he got himself involved in it. But let's just look at those two remarks. The first one comes from his book Monas Hieroglyphica. We demonstrate here that the quaternary is concealed within the ternary. O oh God, pardon me if I have sinned against thee by revealing such a great mystery in my writings, which all may read. But I believe that only those who are truly worthy will understand. What is he saying here? He's saying the quaternary is concealed within the ternary and then quickly apologising to God for having sinned by revealing such a great mystery. Well, clearly that great mystery, as far as the ternary is concerned, is about the Trinity. And that's why he's apologising to God, because he's describing the Trinity, which in Christian terms is the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Though I accept that sometimes wisdom, Sophia, or the word is uh, substituted uh, for one of those. But in the Christian terms, it's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's what he's talking about, the ternary. Uh, what then does he mean by the quaternary? Well, you only have to turn to the front page to see a very nice quaternary that's drawn there in a square, consisting of perhaps the most famous quaternary of them all, uh, the four elements, ignis, air, terra, and aqua. That's fire, air, earth and water believed to be the basis of absolutely everything in the material world and therefore the representation of the material world. So when Dee says that the quaternary is concealed within the ternary, what he means is that God is inseparable from his creation and that the material world, that is to say everything, the stars, the moon, the sun, the earth, the people, the trees, the mud, the water, everything on it um, is part of the Holy Trinity. We, therefore, are in part divine, at least he believes our souls are divine, and that our bodies are connected through uh, this quaternary, through the material world, to God. Something a little bit blasphemous, and he could have got uh, burnt alive as poor old Giordano Bruno was for having exactly the same uh, opinion at the same time. You're looking here at a not very high resolution, I'm afraid, image of Dee's cosmography, his picture of what he calls the primi quatridui mysterium, the four main mysteries. What are we looking at there? Well, we're looking at a big triangle, which obviously uh, represents uh, the divine trinity. And you can see at each of the three corners of that triangle, the sacred tetragrammaton, that's the Hebrew name of God. And from there, you can see rays going back and forth um, to the cosmos, and on the outer ring there, all the stars of the firmament and the inner rings representing uh, the planets, including the moon and the sun. And then through that, what we see is a ring of fire. And then what looks like the pupil of an eye, we see earth and water. It looks like an eye, I think, very deliberately. And people who get uh, conspiracy theory and slightly obsessed will be uh, alarmed, I suspect, uh, to see the similarity between what you see on the dollar sign, the eye of providence. There it is in a triangle. You look closely at that eye and you see uh, the earth and the water in the centre and then the rings of the planets around the outside. Very much taken from the same philosophy as D, which is a Renaissance uh, view. And now uh, we're going to look at a symbol here which represents this quaternary that's concealed within the ternary and is used very much by a modern day uh, Freemasons of the Royal Arch degree. And it, it comprises three T's formulated like that. So that's why it's called a triple tau. And it's known as the clavis ad thesaurum, which means the key to the treasures. That does not mean the key to some safe or vault with a lot of diamonds and rubies in it. It means the key to knowledge of God, essentially, and man and the universe. And so within this so-called triple tau, you see upside down, hidden in plain sight, a fourth T. That is the quaternary that is concealed within the ternary. And that's why it's a symbol of this. It is represented by the number 19 because it has 19 attributes. That's to say five lines, six points and eight angles, which add up to 19. And I'll come back to the relevance of this uh, presently. Uh, just to say that it does connect also to Hermes Trismegistus, who is the great father 
of not only Dee's philosophy, but the philosophy of the Freemasons and the theology of the Freemasons, insofar as it is a T and an H, the initials of Hermes Trismegistus. Um, it is also considered to represent uh, Templum Hierosolima, which means the Temple of uh, Jerusalem. And if you know about the Freemasons, you know that they are obsessively meditating on the Temple of Jerusalem, but we don't need to go that deep into why they're doing it um, now. Okay, so the first remark that I wanted you to ponder on by D is this idea of the quaternary concealed within the ternary, the material world uh, being wrapped up within the divine. This is the second remark of D which connects to it, and it's taking the two together that we're going to unlock the Shakespeare mystery. This second remark is drawn from a preface he wrote to Euclid's Elements, published in 1570, in which he says... May we be led upward by degrees, so informing our rude imagination toward the conceiving of numbers absolutely, that at length we may be able to find the number of our own name gloriously exemplified and registered in the book of Trinity, most blessed and eternal. What does he mean by this? What is meant by the number of our own name that he wants us to find and link to the Trinity? Well, we all have names, and none of us in this present day and age bother much to wonder what the number of our name is. But it mattered enormously to intellectuals, philosophers in the Renaissance, going right back to the wisdom of Solomon 1120, when it is said that God created all things according to number. It is the view of such philosophers as John Dee, that God created the universe using letters and numbers. They were the first forming part. In the beginning was the word. And that since the material world is so connected to the Trinity, the divine Trinity, then our way to get closer to God is by science and discovery and examining everything in the material world and finding its number. And that way we get closer to God. That is at the basis of this uh, rather extraordinary philosophy. So how do we find the number of our name? Well, Dee gives us a clue in his Monus Hieroglyphica. He writes, there are specific reasons for the shapes of letters, their positions or places within the order of the alphabet, their numerical value, and many other things that must be considered with regards to the primary alphabets of the three languages. Now, what he means by the three languages are distinctly Latin, Hebrew and ancient Greek. He is only interested in trying to find the number of things, the number of our own names through these three alphabets. He is not interested in the English alphabet, for instance, which includes a W and a J and V and U are the same letter, for instance. So none of this would work if we use our English alphabet, and we'll come to that. Okay, so what is meant by the number of one's name? If, for instance, you're called Francis Bacon, and you want to be really simplistic about it, you can say, okay, the number is 7-5. That's the letter lengths of Francis Bacon. 7 and 5 add up to 12, which is a 1 and a 2. 1 and a 2 come to 3, which gives you Trinity. Oh, yippee, I've managed to align my name to the Trinity. But of course you haven't quite, because the John Dee and Francis Bacon and all that gang knew pretty well there's a quaternary hidden in there, so just doing that won't actually suffice. Uh, there are other ways of finding the number of your name. Perhaps the most famous and the most obvious is called gematria, where you take the order of the alphabet, which Dee just said is extremely important, and number each letter accordingly, one, two, three, four, five, and then look at the, your name and take the numbers from those letters. So Francis, for instance, is 67. Bacon is 33. Baconians are very aware of this and in, in their history have spent a lot of time, a little bit wasted in my opinion, and we'll come to why that is, looking at the first folio and finding 67 and 33 and saying, well, therefore, uh, Bacon must be Shakespeare. Um, actually, Bacon was aware of the Triple Tower and its significance and the connection of it to his name. We have Lord Bacon's Abacadarium, in which he associates the triple tau, that he calls triplex tau, with the number 67, which is the number of Francis. 
Um, how is he doing that? He's not actually taking the letters one, two, three. Otherwise, three T's, triple tau, would be 57. How does he get to 67? Well, he numbers the Greek alphabet all the way through to 24. That's normal. Uh, but instead of just uh, timesing the T, which is 19 by 3, he carries on giving uh, 25, 26, 27, exactly, uh, etc., with double A, double B, double alpha, double B to double gamma, all the way through to triple tau, which is 67. That's how he does it and connects himself to this uh, very mysterious symbol. Now, John D, um, perhaps that's even simpler. Don't forget, there's no J in Latin, so he's, it begins with an I, Ion D, and he has the letter lengths 4 and 3, and 4 and 3 make 7. And he was in a magical seance on one occasion with St. Michael, who told him directly that 7 knitteth man's soul and body together, 3 in soul and 4 in body. So you understand what is meant by that. The three in soul means the divine trinity. The soul is simply a divine and part of the divine trinity and four in body because the body is from the material world and made of the four elements. That's what he's talking about. Um, of course, seven is interesting to D. As many of you will know, he's said to have occasionally signed himself off as a 007. And that's part of his being a spy, of course, and part of uh, the queen calling him my ubiquitous eyes. So you see his two eyes there um, with the seven going over it, uh, the seven being the four and the three of his name and also symbolizing the connection of himself to God. So there's his number of his name and also the, the, the figure of his name, not just the number here. He signs himself off Dicit Litera Quarta and then puts a triangle with a dot after it. That is Seth, the fourth letter. The triangle obviously represents the trinity, three, but it is the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. So you have that concealed quaternary in the triangle. And that fourth letter is delta, which is pronounced D, hence the dot, which is a shirik in Hebrew. So you've got his pronunciation, the four and the three, um, and the quaternary concealed. Elsewhere, he signs himself just ID, and that too connects the quaternary uh, the hidden quaternary in the ternary, but I'm not going to uh, go into that now. I might do it in question time if you're interested. Uh, here, in the second edition of his preparatory aphorisms, he signs himself again with a triangle um, and gives it away what that's all about uh, because he writes right next to it, quaternarius in ternario conquiescens, meaning that the quaternary rests within the ternary. Okay, now let's have a look at this fellow and see how he resolves the number of his name and connects it to the Trinity. His name is a little bit more complicated than Francis Bacon and John Dee because it has uh, three points of it, the Edward de Vier, which is 624, and also a bit more complicated again because he's also got a title which is Earl of Oxford, but lucky for him, that's 426, which is 624 backwards. So 624 seems to be the name of the game, let's say. Now, just as D signs himself off with a triangle, which is emblematic of his name and the quaternary concealed within the ternary uh, done in a shape. Well, we get from uh, the Earl of Oxford signing himself off in one of his servants' pamphlets and the preface to it, yours at an hour's warning, double V. So how does double V connect him in any way or his name, the number of his name, to God? Well, uh, straight away, we can see uh, that two Vs consists of six points, two angles, and uh, four lines. So that's your six, two, four. And Oxfordians might recognize in the double V, Edward de Vere's motto, which is vero nihil, various, nothing truer than Vere, or nothing truer than truth, i.e. nothing truer than Via in God, since God is truth. Notice how brilliant it is, the two Vs obviously representing zero and various, and nihil, which means nothing, uh, being represented by nothing. So vero nihil virus is, various is cleverly summed up in this. And of course, if you push it together, you get what we call a W, um, but they in the Renaissance, English Renaissance, called a double V. And this connects him to the Trinity, most specifically 
uh, to uh, Jesus, who says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There you see the, the, th the three Vs there representing that trinity or godly trinity. And then, of course, the fourth V, which is the upside down V there representing Veer. So just like you had with D, you've got the connection of Veer and his name, uh, Edward de Veer, Earl of Oxford, uh, connecting it up to a threefold, fourfold trinity. Hope you're following this. It is a complex idea, but once you get it, it's reasonably simple, I think. Okay, so that shows how he uh, connects with a symbol, the number of his name to the Blessed Trinity. But what exactly is the number that he can represent? The way I think he thought this through is to look at this triple tau. I'm speculating here. I've told you that the triple tau can be represented by the number 19 because of its 19 attributes. But if we decide to go down the route of gematria, then we see that the T is 19, just as the tau is 19 in the Greek alphabet. So a triple tau, therefore, is three 19s. So 3T is 57. But we know there's a complication here because it is also represented as four Ts because it has that quaternary concealed within it. And four 19s are 76. So is there any way that Edward de Vere can find the number of his name that is represented both by 76 and by 57. Is that going to be too difficult? Well, very lucky for him, he's called the Earl of Oxford, and if you look at the numbers down below and see O is uh, 14, X is 21, F is 6, etc., etc., you find that Oxford comes to 76. So that's quite lucky because it means that Oxford equals 40. Now, he is the 17th Earl of Oxford, and 17th Earl of is 17 letters. Again, maybe that's just a little bit lucky, isn't it? 1740, and maybe it's just a little bit lucky that 40 is a pun on the number 40. And if you call yourself 1740 and add 17 and 40 together, it comes to 57. So he's got both the 3T and the 40, the, the, the 57 and the 76, the quaternary that is concealed within the ternary in that triple tau, and he's tied it to his name, 17th Earl of Oxford. But also, if you add up the numbers of 1740, that's 1 plus 7 plus 4 plus 0, it comes to 12, and that is the 12 letters of Edward de Vere. So in 1740, he has found the number of his name, just as D asked him to do, and he has aligned it to the Blessed Trinity, which is a threefold, fourfold trinity, with a quaternary that is concealed within the ternary. How clever is that? Now, what's what's the point of it, though? How does he? How is he? How is he going to use this? Well, if we uh, look at his signature, we can tell that it obviously matters a great deal to him. You can see how it's written very precisely and very carefully. There seems to be a great big 10 in the middle and seven dashes. 10 plus 7, of course, is 17. Four dots at the top with an M, which means multiplied by 10, is 40. So you've got 1740 hiding right there in his signature. By the way, M multiplicatus did mean multiply in those days. The, the, the cross sign that we're used to, the multiplication sign, uh, wasn't actually invented until 1631 by William Ortridge. So that's what that M is for, multiplied by 10, which is 40. Now, if you're so keen on 1740 and you're going to give yourself a pseudonym, what do you want to do with your pseudonym but to mirror your number within it? And that is precisely what he does. So if you look at the uh, double V that you can see there, and you see V is 20, so two 20s are 40 and then you follow it by 17 letters, uh, Ilium Shakespeare, and there you've got a mirror of your 1740 in your pseudonym, 4017. And of course, more than that, because as we've seen, the double V at the beginning gives you uh, uh, Edward de Vere, the 624 Earl of Oxford, and the Ilium uh, Shakespeare, if, of course, alludes to Troy, Ilium, where the patron goddess of playwrights uh, shook her spear 
enabling uh, Achilles to slay Hector. Of course, I'm talking about uh, Pallas Minerva, who was the goddess of playwrights to the Romans. So how clever is that, in fact? It's, it's completely brilliant. You've got your 4017, you've got Edward Vere, Earl of Oxford, um, and you've got that reference to Pallas Minerva the patron goddess of playwrights in Ilium Shakespeare. Um, we actually see a great deal of examples of 1740 playing out, and I'll just show you a few of them because there isn't time. I've put a lot of them onto various videos I've put onto YouTube. This you're looking at the very first time that the name William Shakespeare ever appears in a literary context. It is, of course, the dedication to Venus and Adonis of 1593 and you'll see the whole thing is written in italics except for two items. Um, that is to say the capital R at the top, very much embellished, R is the 17th word um, of the Roman alphabet and then of course uh, your honours in all duty comma William Shakespeare dot which is 40 characters. Now, if I were to take you to 1595, to this work, another example. I won't give you too many examples, because I want to get back to John Dee, really, but just to show you how prevalent it is. Um, here's a work called Polymantia, and you can see the 17th full word from the end of the page is Oxford, and that is followed by 40, which is, in fact... The fourth T, counting from the left along that line. So you've got 1740, which is Oxford. If you were to count the full words from the bottom of the page, including the uh, words in the margin notes, and the 17th word is Shakespeare. You can see there that's followed by 4X. X in Latin is 10, so four tens are 40. And uh, once again, if you count the T's, this time, from the right to the left, the fourth T is the one immediately after Shakespeare, the 17th word. So you've got 1740 twice and 1740. Um, many of you will know this particular allusion, particularly Oxfordians. It is extremely interesting, of course, because you've got court dear verse written underneath there, which is a perfect uh, anagram of our de Vere, a secret, um, sitting underneath the word Oxford and a line to the margin note, Sweet Shakespeare. But I'm not really interested in talking about that right now. It, it's about the 1740, which I'm interested to impress upon you. Um, just another example here. Again, I think this is extremely interesting. This is from 1709, so it shows how long this 1740 business was was going on. Um, this is the edition of Nicholas Rose edition of Shakespeare, so pretty late. If you look at that, what's written there, it looks like an obvious declaration of Stratfordianism. Mr. William Shakespeare died A.D. 1616 and uh, in the 53rd year of his age. So hooray, Stratfordianism wins. Well, it doesn't actually. Let's look a bit more carefully at this. Look, for instance, where things are pointing. There's a palm at the top that's pointing to the letter M. M is the 12th letter of the Roman alphabet, and it's pointing straight through the M, in fact, at the 5, which is also being pointed at uh, by the oboe reed. So, in other words, telling us to add the 5 and the 12, which is 17. And then, uh, since adding seems to be what we're doing, there seems to be the word add right in the middle. So we add 16 plus 16, et, which means and, uh, 5 plus 3, add all those numbers together, 16 plus 16 plus 5 plus 3 is 40. If we look at the very top of this bit of writing, we find the R. We've already seen that R is the 17th letter of the alphabet, and that is followed by precisely 40 characters. Look now where that shadow is pointing in the top right. It's coming down, pointing again at that M, which we saw was 12, and then the um, uh, five letters following, 12 plus 5 is 17, and then the double V, as we've seen, V is 20, 2 20 is 40, 17, 40 again. So we have um, 1740 three times on that plinth. And as we all know, where you've got a three, there's a quaternary that is hidden. We need to find the fourth, 1740. We can probably guess where it's going to come. I show you these three triangles. That's actually a, a, another... Uh, emblem of the Royal Arch Freemasons, three triangles which make a quaternary a hidden fourth, and also of course the triple tower which does the same thing. So let us find the fourth, uh, 1740, probably guess where it's going to be actually, can't you? 
If you look up at those two uh, wreaths that seem to be being held above this strange flat picture of Shakespeare, uh, then you can see in the middle an X, and then we look down at his collar, which gives a V, 1, 1, X, V, 1, 1 in Latin is, of course, 17. And then we look for the O's. Well, they're in the, in the wreaths, the one down there, 1, 2, 3, and the 4 O then is the picture itself. So you've got your 1740, um, which is obviously telling us that that figure there is... Uh, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, 1740. I'll give you this very quick fine example because it's not so much about the authorship but what it tells us about the place. This, this is the very, very last speech of Hamlet from the first folio. He says, Oh, I die, Horatio. And notice down here at the end of it, Oh, 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 dies. So oh, 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 oh is obviously... Hamlet, because he says, I die, and oh, 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 dies. Nobody would say that. It's a very bad line to have written, but we all know why they're doing it, because we've just seen it on the on the other thing, that four O's, of course, is uh, four O, which is 40, dies, and it's preceded by the rest is silence, dot, which is, you've guessed it, 17 characters. So 1740 dies, that is telling us that Hamlet, the figure of Hamlet, is based upon Edward De Vere, and as many Oxfordians have pointed out for many, many years, it is a very autobiographical play with uh, literally hundreds of connections uh, through Hamlet to the life and times of Edward de Vere. Okay, let me now get back to John D. And I did say at the very beginning that D uh, is involved in the Shakespeare uh, authorship cover up. It's not just that he inspired Edward de Vere to find the number of his name and to align it to the Trinity in that threefold, fourfold way, that uh, D is actually involved. And what I want to show you now is how this, uh, the dedication to the Shakespeare sonnets published in 1609, that was the year that D died, how it involves the triple tau and how that key to the treasures we can use to unlock it, and how D himself identifies himself as the person who did all this and made it all. So, what's the first thing we can say about this? Well, it's laid out into three uh, triangles. Three threes are nine, yet if you count the lines, you'll see we've got 12 lines, implying there's three too many. Well, again, we're looking at this quaternary that is concealed within the ternary. It would have been simple, you would have thought, just to do uh, three triangles of three lines each, but that is not the way their minds are working. In fact, if you count the line lengths of those triangles, you see they come to six, two, four, which as we saw somewhere near the beginning, that is the number of Edward de Vere's name and his title, Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, it is also uh, June the 24th, 6 to 4, and June the 24th was the day upon which Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, died. We can take this 6 to 4 numbering even further by counting the, the words as demarcated by the dots and hyphens in the order 6 to four and there we find a rather interesting message these sonnets all by ever the fourth t well ever is quite clearly a perfect anagram of veer it's also e veer if you like so it's telling us that the sonnets are all by e veer the fourth t well i hope you're beginning to understand already what is meant by fourth t or four t if we look for the four t on this particular dedication, we see it just above the last T there, uh, written for T. That T, it'll come as no surprise to you, is the 17th T of the dedication. So there we have 1740, that's the encryption of Edward de Vere's name, and it is connected, once again, to the triple tau, the three T's and the quaternary that is concealed within the ternary. 
Now we can see there is a little bit of obsession with triangles going on and with T's going on here. We've looked at the triple tau and I told you it was associated with the number 19 by virtue of its having five lines, six points and eight angles. If you were to count the gematric value of T, it is of course 19. And if you were to count the number of T's in this dedication, including that sign off TT, there are 19. And this brings me, I think, to the most interesting part of what John D has done here. Remember, there is a fascination with things coming in threes. It is by virtue of threes that we unlock this mystery, not only through the triple tau, of course, but through the slogans that were often repeated, tria sunt omnia, threes are all. Tres testimonium dant, threes give testimony. Um, omne trinum perfectum est, everything in threes is perfect. So given the fact that we have three 19s here, all associated with T, which is the triple tau, which is the key to the treasures. Given the fact that John Dee was an absolute obsessive of putting letters into grids, in fact, in just one book alone, he has 49 grids, where he wants us to look at the letters both in diagonal form and down through columns, as well, of course, as the famous Enochian tables, that why not put all of the letters of this dedication into a grid of 19 columns. Well, here it is. Can we see anything catching our eye, anything interesting there? Well, straight away, perhaps we see three Ts, the so-called triple tau. Now, remember, the triple tau is supposed to have a concealed quaternary, a fourth T, probably pointing the wrong way up. Well, that's obviously not the T that you can see at the bottom right there, because that is not a concealed T. That's not concealed within the ternary, is it? Um, if we're looking for the fourth T, it might be somewhere above the word fourth. And it might be upside down. In fact, there it obviously is. And what does it say inside it? De Vere. So that is a very obvious echo of the message we found. Uh, these sonnets all by ever the fourth T. There you can see the fourth T with De Vere written inside it. If we were to extend the plinth upon which it sits just a fraction, then you would see uh, G at one end, that is how the Freemasons uh, depict God, uh, with a G, the seventh letter of course, and then you get uh, four T, which as I told you is the 17th T in that list, so you've got 1740, that's uh, 17th Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere, and then at the end the H T. Uh, which is the triple tau. If we look above it, we have the letters I, S and H. Again, very uh, holy words associated with Jesus and with the triple tau, associated with Jesus through the uh, iota, eta, sigma, the first three letters of Jesus. And with the triple tau, there's the T on top of the H. And it also is said to stand for in signo hoc, in this sign or in hoc signo in this sign. What do we have diagonally written across there? D, I believe that's the first of uh, several of his signatures, which I'm about to show you, which is what has persuaded me that D was the genius behind this extraordinary encryption. What else can we find about this uh, 19 column display of the dedication to Shakespeare's sonnets. Well, we see it begins and ends with the letter T, and T is a symbol of Christ, the Tau cross, and we're obsessed by T's, of course. Uh, and God is the beginning, the middle, and the end. I think we've seen that Jesus calls himself the via, the way, the veritas, the truth, and the vita, the eternal life. If I'm correct about that, then we should find a T right in the middle that represents the truth, the veritas. We drew a, draw a T right in the center on the 10th column. You can see quite easily without being brilliant at crosswords that it contains the letters of veritas. So there we have uh, the via veritas and vita beautifully and symbolically laid out. The first one being the journey, the last one being the eternal life and the truth being 
always in the middle. We can do better than that, actually, because we can turn that veritas into a capital I, the I of Iesus. Remember, there's no J in the Latin alphabet. So Iesus, and then we get the message in Iesum, in Jesus, in the capital I. Veritas, venit, i.e. in Jesus, the truth comes. So if we look for signs of Jesus, we should be able to find the truth quite easily. I've talked to you about um, ISH. I've just shown you how that is Jesus. That's in column nine, which is IX, Iota Chi, the initials of Jesus Christus. Um, so that's a good one. We have another ISH just there in column seven and another one uh, there which is centered on column three. Notice those columns which seem to have this sign, uh, three, seven and nine, which add up to 19. So again, we seem to be unlocking something using the triple tau. Let's go to the first one in column three and something I found a little bit earlier, I won't make you look for it. It looks like the ground plan, doesn't it, of a church complete with its nave, its cross aisles and its cloisters. Where is this church? Well, we only need to anagrammatize the letters within it and we can find that this particular church is in the Westminster. Indeed, it looks very like St Peter's Westminster, which we know as Westminster Abbey. Look what John Dee has left behind inside the cloister. Again, I would say this is a very deliberate signature and sign of his brilliance um, in creating that. So that's column three. Let's look in the one in column seven. Seven, of course, is the number of Christ's forgiveness. If you're asked to repent your sins seven times, Christ says he'll forgive you. So seven is the number of Christ's forgiveness. So let's draw the T, the sign of Christ. Anything to do with Christ's forgiveness there? Yes, indeed. Perfect anagram of eleison. Christe eleison means Christ have mercy. And there's more to that in column seven to do with forgiveness, because if we draw the cross of St. Peter, who is the patron saint, of forgiven sinners, that's the upside down cross, known as the Petra and cross, we see within it Isle and South using a Y as a TH, a thorn. So you have St. Peter's South Cross Isle. Well, St. Peter's Westminster is, of course, Westminster Abbey, and the South Cross Isle is what we now know as Poet's Corner. So we're being led there for some reason, and we're being told that the truth in Jesum Veritas Venit in the capital I, so column. A nine, which, is, as I say, is the initials of Jesus Christus with that I-S-H in it. If we draw our capital I for Jesus three times, what message do we get there? Well, we can see at the bottom, De Vere. We've already been dealing with that. And if you read from the top to the bottom, lies here. If I take E-D-V from the bottom uh, to represent Edward De Vere, then, and then we have um, lies here, very simply written there. So we're being told that Edward de Vere is buried in the South Cross Isle at St Peter's Westminster, that's Westminster Abbey. Now we're going to turn to find out the exact spot where he lies. So let's put all those back together in the three triangles where we found them and turn the page to the title page, Shakespeare's Sonnets, mm, 19 letters again. Now, it was Alan Green who discovered a great mystery that was hidden here uh, regarding this line, which points from the dot by G, which stands for God, and the dot by D, which perhaps stands for Deus, God. And he discovered that joining the two ends of this line to various points and line ends on the right, you get something very extraordinary. One right angle triangle, another right angle triangle, another one, and another one. There are four perfect right angle triangles there. And, of course, the angles of a triangle are 180, so four triangles are 720. And, yes, guess what? Uh, that is the same as the angles 720 on the triple tau, which has, of course, four T's in it. Triangle, 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 triangle. So there is a connection to the triple tau and four triangles. Alan Green discovered also, using Thales' theorem, that these four triangles are concealing a perfect circle. What he didn't note, and to which I've added, I think, an important addition to this, is that one can use this geometry and cut across from that G dot um, to make a, 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 a cross in the middle, and coming down from the stem of the P of Shakespeare's, we form the Chi Rho symbol, that ancient symbol 
of Christ, which maybe totally coincidentally consists of the Rho, uh, which is the 17th letter of the Greek alphabet, and the Chi, uh, which in biblical gematria is the number 40. So you actually have 1740 right out there, hidden in on the front title page. This has been drawn with such extraordinary accuracy. Note how the stem of the P goes down, passing just to the right of the N of sonnet uh, between the N and the E. That signifies just a few degrees northeast, and we're going to see why that's important in just a second. But then it comes down and passes through the very centre of that circle with the centre of that cross. And then it goes a little bit lower and it passes uh, just to the right of the stem of the capital D, just there, giving us the initials I, D in a triangle. Again, I'm pretty sure that is our clever clogs, uh, John D signing himself off right there. And then of course, um, it lands on a dot uh, just by uh, the letters 14. Now, uh, G is God, as, as we know, and Christ is truth, ego sum veritas. So let's see what truth we can find by looking where this Cairo symbol is pointing. Looking first um, at the cross, we have bottom left by G, that's by God, um, and top right, D, and V, E on top left, and R, E. So we've got Shakespeare's sonnets by God and De Vere again. And of course, there is a fifth point, uh, which is captioned by 4T, and yes, there are 17 letters in that line. It's 1740, and yes, that T is the fourth T on this page. So I think that is going to tell us where Edward de Vere is buried within the South Cross Isle of St. Peter's, Westminster. If I were to get up uh, a, a map of St. Peter's, Westminster, the South Cross Isle there on the right, and compare it. One very interesting thing is these columns don't actually go totally due north. They're about four degrees northeast, which is why I said it was very clever that that line was passing um, through sonnets in that particular way. So what we're going to do is put the centre of the compass in the centre of those pillars and centre it to the centre of the outer pillars, draw a circle and then uh, move uh, the whole of this over it so that they see where that 40 dot actually lands and that should be where Edward de Vere is buried in the South Cross Isle. There's the exact spot. I'll try and magnify it up for you. Turn it around. I don't know if you can see that. But it lands, hokey cokey, it lands on the Shakespeare Monument in Westminster Abbey, which was placed there, yes, you've guessed it, in 1740. And if we look at the scroll to which he's pointed, you can see that he's muddled up the Shakespeare quotation by putting the cloud cup towers on the top and taking the E out of it so it has 17 letters, it shouldn't be there, it should be lower down that particular line, and lining it up like a Masonic square with four T's on the left. Reminding us all, does it not, of the Stratford-upon-Avon monument which has your 17 characters and four T's like a Masonic square in the bottom right, obviously made to complement each other I suppose. We also see if we look at the monument as it originally was uh, when it was first done, it had 17 iron railings, 17 spears facing on the front. And you can see how he's standing, still standing like that to this day, representing the four and the X, four tens, of course, which is 1740. Then if we could see him from behind, which we can't because of that wall, so I can flip him round, you see how his, um, how his position becomes um, the chi rho, which, as I have said, is the rho being the 17th letter, and biblical gematria, the chi being 40. So there you have your 3 plus 1, 1740, on the very monument that sits right on top of where Edward de Vere is buried, and it's using this 1740, which connects the number of Edward de Vere's name, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, with the threefold, fourfold trinity, which is exactly what John Dee asked to be done in 1570. Now, this is my last slide, and I think is the one that really shows the absolutely incalculable genius of John Dee and what he has done here. Just to remind, we saw how a double V is used 
uh, to represent the number of Edward de Vere's name, the 624, and how it also alludes to his motto, Vero Nihil Verius, nothing truer than Vere and nothing truer than truth, i.e. nothing truer than Vere in God. We saw that. We also saw how the capital G is used by the Freemasons, the seventh letter, to mean a god. And I think I've really drilled into you by now this idea of the triple tau with the quaternary that is concealed within the ternary and also the the three triangles which put together in such a way form uh, the quaternary, the, another triangle pointing the other direction. So given that we have our three triangles on the right in the dedication, and given all that I've shown you about the quaternary, it is obvious, is it not, to us by this stage, that there should be a fourth triangle hidden in the centre, the centre representing veritas, which is truth, the first one representing via, which is the way, and the last triangle representing the eternal life. So can we find the veritas, can we find the truth, an upside down triangle hidden here in the very center? Well, obviously it is going to be formed of an anagram of what it says there, our ever living poet wisheth. And this is what I found. So it now reads and makes perfect sense to the only begetter of these ensuing sonnets, Mr. W.H., all happiness, and that eternity promised by God, double V, the poet, vero nihil verius, the well-wishing adventurer in setting forth. You see then how we have the via, the veritas, and the vita, all symbolised in those three triangles. Once we have turned the key, the clavis ad thesaurum, the key to the treasures, once we used that triple tau and John Dee's extraordinary words of wisdom about hiding one's name. But look what happens when you turn it upside down. There, I think, we find the grail, uh, the chalice, the funerary urn, if you like, it doesn't matter, that's what is left of Edward de Vere, are the sonnets when turned upside down to form that beautiful image. That is why I say that this absolutely sensational encryption is not just a tribute to Edward de Vere as the one who owned the name William Shakespeare in 1740, but I think it is a tribute to the absolute uh, mathematical, uh, puzzling, mysterious genius of this fellow, uh, John Dee, and he must be honoured for this work. I think that's all I want to say right now, and I'd be more than happy to stick around and answer any questions that anyone might have. And we do have questions in the chat. Sonnet 14 seems to reject astrology, not from the stars do I my judgment pluck. Do you have any comments? Um, uh, no, I have no comments on that, um, except to say that Edward de Vere was very famed for his love of ast astrology. Um, and I'm, I'm always a little bit cautious, to be honest with you, about interpreting the sonnets and I know many people have done brilliant work on it but it, it will always be an area of debate except I think for the first 17 which I think everyone universally agrees uh, are, are dealing with uh, the a fair youth and the demand that he procreate. Uh, I would not, in short, I would not read that comment on sonnet 14 as meaning that Shakespeare wasn't interested in, in the cosmos and in the planets because we know he was through all the plays. Here's a question. Your work seems very compelling to me as a layperson reader with only very limited grasp of numerology, cryptology, etc. But have you made an effort to get a rigorous, critical outside review of your analysis by a qualified cryptologist with no dog in the fight as to the Shakespeare authorship question? Thank you. Um, well, I've had a mathematician look at it and he his head exploded, to be honest. <laughs> that is so difficult. And so I said, well, look, can you um, can you can you reduce it to just certain elements of it? So anyway, he, he did that. And I think he's published it somewhere. But, you know, it gets so ridiculous um, uh, when you look at these these numbers that they're almost meaningless in themselves. But he came up with 0.176 times 
uh, 10 to the power of minus 13. So that was the probability of those things being there by, by sheer accident. In the end, though, one's led by one's personal interests and, and common sense guides me uh, to say that it's absolutely inconceivable that the things I showed there are there by fluke. I mean, it, it's, we're just in baby imagine land, if anyone can think that. I believe there is a, um, a, a magazine or a very serious um, journal called Cryptology. I, there's nothing I'd like more than for them uh, to look into it. Great. I have another question. I have seen critics sometimes point out that Edward de Vere himself more often used Oxenford or some other variation rather than Oxford. Comments on how spelling issues may affect your analysis. That is an interesting point. In fact, if you looked at the, um, the signature that I showed there, he signed himself in that signature, Oxenford. He does sign Oxford as well elsewhere. But my point uh, doesn't, actually, that doesn't actually change, that the 17th Earl of Oxford gives you 1740. And I've heard a lot of, um, I've heard a lot of people saying, well, in the plays, for instance, uh, I think Alan Nelson says, well, in the plays, he says, Earl of Oxford. Oxford and Oxenford are, in point of fact, interchangeable. As we all know, uh, during Oxford's life, uh, lots and lots and lots of people were referring to him openly and talking about him as Earl of Oxford. So he was Earl of Oxford. He, he mainly signed himself Oxenford, but it goes back um, to long before this whole 1740 thing happened. I think the earliest signature we have, he signs himself Ox Inford. That's the little French letter I think he writes to, to Burley. But I, it, it, it's never occurred to me that that in any way damages the point I'm, I'm making, which is that 1740 works for Earl of Oxford, um, as well as 1740, which is the 57 of the Triple Tower. Here's another question. With the closing of the theatres and the attacks from the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church and the Puritans, and even the materialist philosophies, the vast imaginative understanding of occult Neoplatonism to which you are speaking vanished along with the Shakespeare plays themselves. The Neoplatonist ideas and the plays were gone and lost for at least a generation and the art was replaced in 1660 by the rhymed couplet, which was dominant for over a century. Do you feel we as scholars and theater companies and audiences have recovered what is lost? Well, uh, no, no, not everything of what's lost, but I, I feel there's a huge energy going on now uh, to try to recover some of this. And it, it wasn't just lost. You've got to remember that actually it was actively fought against the father and son, Merrick and Isaac Kazubon, who, who worked very hard to uh, rid England of hermeticism, neoplatonic thought, and, and, and to rubbish John Dee, in fact. Uh, that was what seemed to be going on. And, and so there was, a, I think, a willful attempt to get rid of it, possibly uh, by the church uh, on both sides, the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England uh, wanted to get rid of it, which again comes back to why a lot of this stuff is rather secretive and rather veiled and why it is um, that, that D says, oh, God, forgive me for revealing such a mystery where all may read, but only the truly worthy will understand. I mean, he could have, he could have said it straight out about that quaternary um, that is hidden within the ternary. Uh, funnily enough, that is more or less said straight out, but published much later uh, by Edward Kelly. And Edward Kelly, as, as I'm sure m many know, was, was D's sidekick. The D scryer. He looked into the crystal globes and told D what the angels were saying. And Edward Kelly wrote in a book published, I have to say, long after his lifetime, this, God has stamped and sealed all created things with the character of Trinity as a kind of hieroglyphical writing whereby his own nature might be shown. For the number three and the magic number four make up the perfect number seven, the seal of many mysteries. And seeing that the quaternary rests within the ternary, it is a number which stands on the horizon of eternity and doth exhibit everything bound with God in us, thus including God, men and all created things with all their mysterious powers. He's sort of telling you that what underlies this principle, the idea that, that man and creation is part of God. But you have to remember that was blasphemous. That was not accepted by the churches. But I, I hope that in the, the talk I gave just there, that, that, that it's as straightforward in a way as, as one can make uh, this, this very strange and veiled mystery. And there are two 1609 sonnets quartos. Is the geometry the same in both? 
No, it's not. And um, this brings up an extremely interesting set of questions because you can't do that front page geometry on the right edition. You can only do it on the Aspley edition. We know that Edward de Vere was buried at Hackney originally. So the question is, uh, when was he moved? His cousin, uh, Percival Golding, says he was moved to Westminster, but we don't know when. If we could date that Percival, the, the Golding remark, that would really help. My guess is he was moved in 1619. Um, somewhere around there. But it, this, this creates a, a little problem to do with the two editions. And Aspley was involved with Jaggard, and Jaggard was also involved, this was a printer, um, in backdating a lot of Shakespeare quartos in uh, 1619. These are known as the Pavier quartos, and, and they've, got the, they've got dates on them like 1608, and 1609, when in point of fact, we know from paper analysis that they were actually printed in 1619. Now, I, I suspect, and I, and I stress this is pure speculation, but I suspect that the Aspley edition uh, may be backdated and from 1619 and is part of that. But I would really love someone someday to do a paper analysis to see whether the Aspley and the right editions came off the same presses but I suspect they didn't. I think they were pro probably set up as early as 1609, maybe even earlier. But it opens up a lot of very interesting questions about did Veer know that he was going to be moved to that exact spot? Which by the way, is, is, is a very, very interesting spot. It's not any old spot. I mean, that, that, the, the geometry of that position with the, the tombs of Chaucer and Spencer is, is, is a perfect uh, right angle triangle of, of angles 60, 90, 30. Uh, but that position is very, very special. And not only is it very, very special, but uh, in that way, but it was also an enclosed space within Westminster Abbey, that spot. It wasn't as we see it now, it's not open with the rest. So he was enclosed, but he was very near the graves of Beaumont, Chaucer and Spencer. So what are we seeing there? We're seeing the same thing. It's the fourth, the, the quaternary that's hidden in the ternary. He is, he is the anonymous poet um, who's hidden. That's why William Bass talks about this threefold, fourfold tomb when he's talking about the tomb of Spencer, Chaucer and um, Beaumont. And then he's talking about Shakespeare's tomb as a threefold, fourfold. It, it's, it's all back to this same thing. So it is, I mean, what I would love, of course, my obsessiveness has been the Shakespeare authorship question, but I would love to know whether this threefold, fourfold, this quaternary concealed in the ternary, whether it unlocks any other great secrets. I bet it jolly well does. Here's another question. How did the 19 get to be the number of columns you chose for the array of letters? So as I, as I explained, um, actually in the talk, um, we, we noticed there an obsession with T's. We, we, we had that message, these sonnets all by ever the fourth T. And we looked just above it and we saw four T and a triangle of T's. And when, when we actually looked in that 19th column, we saw uh, De Vere as the fourth T. So there's definitely an obsession with T's. Now, T is 19, whether, whether you're looking at the Greek alphabet Tau is the 19th letter of the Greek alphabet, or in the Roman Latin alphabet, T is the 19th letter. Um, as I also mentioned, I think that the triple tau, which I believe so much of this seems to be based on, uh, it consists of 19 attributes. Uh, it has five lines, six points and eight angles that adds up to 19. Not only that, if you look at the, uh, uh, the dedication itself and count the T's, there are 19 T's on that page. So you've got three reasons connected with T and triple tau to be going to a 19 column arrangement. And you could say that if you want your three plus one, well, you actually only have to look at the title of the whole pamphlet, which is Shakespeare's sonnets, which is 19 letters. Have you made any progress with looking further at the location in Westminster for evidence to support his burial there? So when I, um, worked out the spot where he was buried. I knew how it was going to work, that I, that I overlaid uh, this, this front cover, put it on top of the South Cross Isle, and that that spot where the fourth T was, was going to land 
on where he's buried. So when I realized the system, I was almost trembling and saying to myself, right, the minute I can see where that spot is, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into a, um, in, into a car and I go straight to Westminster Abbey and look at that spot. And if I'm lucky in any way at all, maybe there'll be a little mark on a little stone or something. Well, of course, as I moved it over and it landed, it landed smack on top of the Shakespeare monument. So that in itself seemed to be absolute <laughs> total justification and verification of what I, I was doing and, and, and has led me to believe that it has to be correct. I, I have literally no doubts whatsoever that that is correct. However, I do appreciate that there are people who say, well, uh, jolly interesting as it is, we, we want to move that statue, dig underneath and, and find out the body and see if the coffin has anything in there. Now, all of this was sort of planned with some friends of mine who have very high up connections within Freemasonry. I, by the way, am not a, not a Freemason and, and would never become one under any circumstances because I disagree fundamentally with their policy on, on secrets. I think that everything, uh, anything worth knowing must be shared. And I do accept that there are occasions when you hold back the truth. There was an arrangement was made to meet with the Dean and three very, very prominent uh, Freemasons. And I was going to take them through the evidence that I had had and said, look, now I'm surely there is a case uh, to do some digging or moving or find out what's there. Uh, COVID was what stopped that meeting and it has, hasn't since been rearranged, but it is something I'd be very interested in pursuing. John D. died in 1609. How did this cipher get transmitted down a generation and translated years later into the Stratford Monument inscription? Without a question, it, it is being kept alive within uh, Freemasonic circles. And, and that doesn't mean for a second that every single Freemason uh, knows the secret and knows that that code. Do you think John D. could be another guise of Edward de Vere? Um, uh, no. <laughs> Nearly always you find, if you look at uh, patterns of, I mean, look at Vienna and, uh, at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, and there you've got Schubert and Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven, and they're all sort of crowded in there at the same time. Um, so I think very often you find very great minds um, even in dis different disciplines, they're grouping together in time. And so, no, John Dee was an exceptional man. He was quite a lot older than, than the Earl of Oxford, uh, but he was part of the, of the great minds that inspired other people. And no doubt he was inspired the other way around. He, he, he was very keen on theatre, and I wouldn't doubt at all that he was very inspired uh, by the Earl of Oxford. There's a hell of a lot more to find out. And I'm always very excited when people like Glenn, and there's quite a lot of people out there now, who are starting to look at this through this lens and they, and they are finding some amazing things. So it's a great team effort. We're all building on each other's, uh, on, on each other's work. And uh, I, I just think it's very exciting. There's a bit of a movement going on now. They only have to look at D and look at things going on to know it's happening. And, and so we need to encourage it. We need to guide each other. We need to try and stop each other if we think we're going too far and too silly, um, um, but just work at it. And, and I think there's much more to be to be discovered if we pay attention to it. Thank you all for 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 being part of this.